Chapter One, Part One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter One, Part One The Ball belonging to one of the first families in france still young and with a face that would have been agreeable had it not been for the almost ridiculous and disproportionate length of his nose m de lucenay joined to a restless love of constant motion the habit of talking and laughing fearfully loud upon subjects quite at variance with good taste or polished manners and throwing himself into attitudes so abrupt and awkward that it was only by recalling who he was that his being found in the midst of the most distinguished societies in paris could be accounted for or a reason assigned for tolerating his gestures and language for both of which he had now by dint of long practice and adherence acquired a sort of free license or impunity he was shunned like the plague although not deficient in a certain description of wit which told here and there amid the indescribable confusion of remarkable phraseology which he allowed himself the use of in fact he was one of those unintentional instruments of vengeance one would always like to employ in the wholesale chastisement of persons who have rendered themselves either ridiculous or abhorrent the duchess de lucenay one of the most agreeable and at the same time most fashionable women in paris spite of her having numbered thirty summers had more than once furnished matter of conversation among the scandal dealers of paris but her errors whatever they were supposed to be were pardoned in consideration of the heavy drawback of such a partner as monsieur de lucenay another feature in the character of this latter-named individual was a singular affectation of the most absurd and unknown expressions relative to imaginary complaints and ridiculous infirmities he amused himself in supposing you suffered from and concerning which he would make earnest inquiries in a loud voice and in the immediate presence of a hundred persons but possessed of first-rate courage and always ready to take the consequences of his disagreeable jokes m de lucenay had been concerned in various affairs of honour arising out of them with varied success coming off sometimes victor sometimes vanquished without being in any way cured of his unpleasant and annoying tricks all this premised we will ask the reader to imagine the loud harsh voice of the personage we have been describing shouting from the distance at which he first recognised madame d'harville and sarah hola hola who is that out there come who is it let's see what the prettiest woman at the ball sitting out here away from everybody i can't have this it is high time i returned from the other end of the world to put a stop to such doings as this i tell you what marquise if you persist in thus concealing yourself from general view and cheating people from looking at you i will set up a cry of fire fire that shall bring every one out of the ballroom around you and then by way of terminating his discourse m de lucenay threw himself almost on his back beside the two ladies crossed his left leg over his right thigh and held his foot in his hand you have soon returned from constantinople my lord observed madame d'harville fancying it was necessary to say something and at the same time drawing away from her unpleasant neighbour with ill-concealed impatience ah that is just what my wife said already back my lord exclaimed she when she saw me alight from my travelling carriage why bless me i did not expect you so soon and do you know instead of flying to my arms as if the surprise had delighted her she turned quite sulky and refused to appear with me at this my first ball since my return and upon my soul i declare her staying away has caused a far greater sensation than my presence droll isn't it upon my life i declare i can't make it out when she is with me nobody pays the least attention to me but when i entered the room alone to-night such a crowd came humming and buzzing around me all calling out at once where is madame de lucenay is not she coming this evening oh dear what a disappointment how vexatious how disagreeable etc etc and then marquise when i come where you are and expect after returning all the way from constantinople you will be overjoyed to see me you look upon me as if i were a dog running amidst an interesting game of ninepins and yet for all i see i am just as agreeable as other people and it would have been so easy for you to have continued agreeable in the east added madame d'harville slightly smiling 
stop abroad you mean i suppose yes i dare say i tell you i could not and i would not and it is not quite what i like to hear you say so exclaimed m de lucenay uncrossing his legs and beating the crown of his hat after the fashion of a tambourine well for heaven's sake my lord be still and do not call out so very loudly said madame d'harville angrily or really you will compel me to change my place change your place ah to be sure you want to take my arm and walk about the gallery a little come along then i am ready walk with you certainly not and pray let me beg of you not to meddle with that bouquet and have the goodness not to touch the fan either you will only break it as you always do oh bless you talking of breaking fans i am unlucky did my wife ever show you a magnificent chinese fan given to her by madame de vaudemont well i broke that and having delivered himself of these comforting words m de lucenay again threw himself back on the divan he had been lounging on but with his accustomed gaucherie contrived to pitch himself over the back of it on to the ground grasping in his hand a quantity of the floating wreaths of climbing plants which depended from the boughs of the trees under which the party was sitting and which he had been for some time amusing himself with essaying to catch as moved by the light breeze admitted into the place they undulated gracefully over his head the suddenness of his fall brought down not only those he held but the parent stems belonging to them and poor de lucenay was so covered by the mass of foliage thus unexpectedly obtained that ere he could thoroughly disengage himself from their circling tendrils he presented the appearance of some monarch of may-day crowned with his leafy diadem so whimsical an appearance as he presented drew down roars of deafening stunning laughter much to the annoyance of madame d'harville who would quickly have got out of the vicinity of so awkward and unpleasant a person had she not perceived m charles robert the commandant of madame pipelet's accounts advancing from the other end of the gallery and unwilling to appear as though going to meet him she once more resumed her seat beside m de lucenay i say lady macgregor vociferated the incorrigible de lucenay didn't i look preciously like a wild man of the woods or the god pan or a sylvan or a naiad or some of those savage creatures with that green wreath round my head oh but talking of savages added he abruptly approaching sarah lady macgregor i must tell you a most outrageously indecent story just imagine that at otaheite my lord duke interrupted sarah in a tone of freezing rebuke just as you like you are not obliged to hear my story if you don't like it you are the loser that's all ah i see madame de fonbonne out there i shall keep it for her she is a dear kind creature and will be delighted to hear it so i'll save it for her madame de fonbonne was a fat little woman of about fifty years of age very pretending and very ridiculous her fat double chin rested on her equally fat throat and she was continually talking with upturned eyes of her tender her sensitive soul the languor of her soul the craving of her soul the aspirations of her soul to these disadvantages she added the additional one of being particularly ill-dressed upon the present occasion in a horrible-looking copper-coloured turban with a sprinkling of green flowers over it yes again asserted de lucenay in his loudest voice that charming anecdote shall be told to madame de fonbonne may i be permitted my lord duke to inquire the subject of your conversation said the lady thus apostrophized who hearing her name mentioned immediately commenced her usual mincing bridling attempts to draw up her chubby self but failing in the effort fell back upon the easier manoeuvre of rolling up the whites of her eyes as it is commonly called it refers madam to a most horribly indecent revolting and strange story heaven bless me and who dares oh dear me who would venture i would madame i can answer for the truth of the anecdote and that it would make a stick or a stone blush to hear it but as i am aware how dearly you love such stories i will relate it to you you must know then that in otaheite my lord exclaimed the indignant lady turning up her eyes with indignant horror it really is surprising you can allow yourself to now for those unkind looks you shall not hear my pretty story either though i had been reserving it for you and now look at you 
i can but wonder that you so celebrated for the taste and good style of your dress should have put that wretched thing on your head for a turban but which looks more like an old copper baking-dish spotted all over with verre gris so saying the duke as if charmed with his own wit burst into a loud and long peal of laughter if my lord exclaimed the enraged lady you merely returned from the east to resume your offensive jokes which are tolerated because you are supposed to be only half in your senses all who know you are bound to hope you intend to return as quickly as you came saying which she arose and majestically waddled away i tell you what lady macgregor if i don't take devilish good care i shall let fly at that stupid old prude and pull her old stewpan off her head said m de lucenay thrusting his hands deep down into his pockets as if to prevent their committing the retaliating mischief he contemplated but no said he after a pause i won't hurt the sensitive soul poor innocent thing ha 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 besides think of her being an orphan at her tender age and renewed peals of laughter announced that the imagination of the duke had again found a fresh fund of amusement in some reminiscence of madame de fonbonne which however soon gave place to an expression of surprise as the figure of the commandant sauntering towards them caught his eye hola cried he there's m charles robert i met him last summer at the german baths he is a deuced fine fellow sings like a swan now marquise i'll show you some fun just see how i'll bother him would you like me to introduce him to you be quiet if you can said sarah turning her back most unceremoniously upon m de lucenay and let us alone i beg as m charles robert while affecting to be solely occupied in admiring the rare plants on either side of him continued to advance m de lucenay had cleverly contrived to get possession of sarah's flacon d'esprit and was deeply and silently engaged in the interesting employment of demolishing the stopper of the trinket still m charles robert kept on his gradual approach to the party he was in reality making the object of his visit his figure was tall and finely proportioned his features boasted the most faultless regularity his dress was in the first style of modern elegance yet his countenance his whole person were destitute of grace or that distingue air which is no more to be coveted than mere beauty whether a face or figure his movements were stiff and constrained and his hands and feet large and coarse as he approached madame d'harville his insipid and insignificant countenance assumed all at once an expression of the deepest melancholy too sudden to be genuine nevertheless he acted the part as closely to nature as might be m robert had the air of a man so thoroughly wretched so oppressed by a multitude of sorrows that as he came up to madame d'harville she could not help recalling to mind the fearful mention by sarah touching the violence to which grief such as his might drive him how are you how are you my dear sir exclaimed the duc de lucenay interrupting the further approach of the commandant i have not had the pleasure of seeing you since we met at the spas of but what the devil ails you are you ill hereupon m charles robert assumed a languid and sentimental air and casting a melancholy look towards madame d'harville replied in a tone of deep depression indeed my lord i am very far from being well god bless me why what is the matter with you ah i suppose that confounded plaguy cough still sticks to you said m de lucenay with an appearance of the most serious interest in the inquiry at this ridiculous question m charles robert stood for a moment as though struck dumb with astonishment but quickly recovering himself said while his face crimsoned and his voice trembled with rage in a short firm voice to m de lucenay since you express so much uneasiness respecting my health my lord i trust you will not fail calling to-morrow to know how i am upon my life and soul my dear sir i-but most certainly i will send said the duke with a haughty bow to m charles robert who coolly returning it walked away the best of the joke is said m de lucenay throwing himself again by the side of sarah that our tall friend there had no more of a spitting complaint than the great turk himself unless indeed i stumbled upon the truth without knowing it well he might have that complaint for anything i know or care what do you think lady macgregor did that great tall fellow look to you as though he were suffering from la pituite 
note one a sort of viscous phlegmy complaint sarah's only reply was an indignant rising from her seat and hasty removal from the vicinage of the annoying duc de lucenay all this had passed with the rapidity of thought sarah had experienced considerable difficulty in restraining her inclination to indulge in a hearty fit of laughter at the absurd question by the duc de lucenay to the commandant but madame d'harville had painfully sympathized with the feelings of a man so ridiculously interrogated in the presence of the woman he loved then horror struck as the probable consequences of the duke's jest rose to her mind led away by her dread of the duel which might arise out of it and still further instigated by a feeling of deep pity for one who seemed to her misled imagination as marked out for every venomed shaft of envy malice and revenge clemence rose abruptly from her seat took the arm of sarah overtook m charles robert who was boiling over with rage and whispered to him as she passed to-morrow at one o'clock i will be there then regaining the gallery with the countess she immediately quitted the ball rodolph in appearing at this fete besides fulfilling a duty imposed on him by his exalted rank and place in society was further influenced by the earnest desire to ascertain how far his suspicions as regarded madame d'harville were well founded and if she were indeed the heroine of madame pipelet's account after quitting the winter garden with the countess de Blanc, he had in vain traversed the various salons in the hopes of meeting madame d'harville alone he was returning to the hot-house when being momentarily delayed at the top of the stairs he was witness to the rapid scene between madame d'harville and m charles robert after the joke played off by the duc de lucenay the significant glances exchanged between clemence and the commandant struck rodolph powerfully and impressed him with the firm conviction that this tall and prepossessing individual was the mysterious lodger of the rue du temple wishing for still further confirmation of the idea he returned to the gallery a waltz was about to commence and in the course of a few minutes he saw m charles robert standing in the doorway evidently revelling in the satisfaction of his own ideas enjoying in the first place the recollection of his own retort to m de lucenay for m charles robert in spite of his egregious folly and vanity was by no means destitute of bravery and secondly revelling in the triumph of thus obtaining a voluntary assignation with madame d'harville for the morrow and something assured him that this time she would be punctual rodolph sought for murphy do you see that fair young man said he standing in the midst of that group out there you mean the tall individual who seems so much amused with his own thoughts do you not yes yes i see him endeavour to get sufficiently near to him to be enabled to whisper so that he alone can catch the words while you carefully avoid allowing him to see the person who utters them this sentence you are late my angel the squire gazed at rodolph with a perplexed air my lord do you seriously wish me to do this seriously my dear murphy i do and should he hastily turn around when you have spoken assume that incomparable air of perfect nonchalance for which you are so justly celebrated so as to prevent his being able to fix upon you as the person who has spoken depend upon my perfect obedience my lord although i am far from having the slightest idea of your intention in assigning to me such a task before the conclusion of the waltz the worthy murphy had contrived to place himself immediately behind m charles robert while rodolph posted in a situation most advantageous for watching the effect of this experiment carefully observed murphy's movements in a minute m charles robert turned suddenly around as though struck with astonishment and wonder the immovable squire stirred not a feature and certainly murphy's tall portly figure bald head and grave composed countenance appeared the least likely of any in the room to be those of a man taking part in such a trick and indeed it was evident from the continued gaze of the commandant in every other part of the space they stood in that m charles robert was far from suspecting his respectable middle-aged neighbour of giving utterance to a phrase so disagreeably recalling the quid pro quo of which madame pipelet had been alike the cause and the heroine the waltz concluded murphy rejoined rodolph well my lord said he that smart young gentleman jumped as though he had trodden on a hornet's nest the words i uttered appear to have the effect of magic on him they were so far magical my dear murphy as they assisted me to discover a circumstance i was most anxious to find out conviction thus painfully obtained 
rodolph could only deplore the dangerous position in which madame d'harville had placed herself and which seemed to him fraught with fresh evils from a vague presentiment of sarah's being either a sharer or a confidant in the transaction and with this discovery came the fresh pain of believing that he had now found out the source of m d'harville's secret sorrow the man he so highly esteemed and for whom he felt a brother's regard was pining in silence over the misconduct of a wife he so tenderly loved yet who in spite of her many charming qualities could sacrifice her own and her husband's happiness for the sake of an object so every way unworthy master of so important a secret yet incapable of betraying it unable to devise any plan to open the eyes of madame d'harville who seemed rather to yield to than resist her unlicensed passion for her lover rodolph found himself obliged to remain a passive witness to the utter ruin of a woman he had so passionately adored with as much silence as devotion nay whom spite of his best efforts he still loved he was roused from these reflections by m de graun if your royal highness said the baron bowing will deign to grant me a brief interview in one of the lower rooms which is now quite devoid of company i shall have the honour to lay before you the particulars you desired me to collect rodolph sighed to m de graun to conduct him to the place named when the baron proceeded with his recital as follows the only duchess to whose name the initials n and l can possibly belong is madame de lucenay whose maiden name was normant her grace is not here this evening i have just seen m de lucenay her husband who it seems left paris five months ago with the expressed intention of travelling in the east during the next year or two but has unexpectedly returned within the last day or two it may be recollected that during rodolph's visit to the rue du temple he picked up on the landing-place adjoining the door of the charlatan dentist's apartments a cambric handkerchief richly embroidered and trimmed with costly lace and bearing in the corner a ducal coronet with the initials n l it will also be borne in mind that this elegant indication of high rank was wedded with the bitter tears of its noble owner in pursuance of his instructions but in total ignorance of the circumstances suggesting them m de graun had inquired the name of every duchess then in paris and gleaned the information now repeated to rodolph and which the latter perfectly comprehended he had no reason for interesting himself in the fate of madame de lucenay but he could not reflect without a shudder that if it were really she who visited the pretended doctor but who he felt assured was no other than the infamous polidori this wretch having possessed himself of her real name and address through the agency of tortillard might make a fearful use of a secret which placed the duchess so completely in his power chance is a strange thing my lord is it not resumed m de graun it is but how does it apply to the present case why at the very instant that m de grangeneuve was giving me these facts concerning m and madame de lucenay and was adding rather ill-naturedly that the unlooked-for return of the duke must have proved particularly disagreeable not only to the duchess but to the viscount de st remy one of the most elegant and fashionable men in paris his excellency the ambassador came up and inquired whether your royal highness would permit him to present the viscount to you as having just been appointed on the legation to gerolstein he would be happy to avail himself of the present opportunity of paying his court to your highness an expression of impatience escaped rodolph who exclaimed nothing could have been less agreeable to me however it is impossible to refuse let the count know therefore that i am ready to receive m de st remy end of chapter one part one read by celine major chapter one part two of the mysteries of paris volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the mysteries of paris by eugene Sue. chapter one part two rodolph knew too well how to support his princely dignity to allow his feelings to interfere with the courtesy and affability required on the present occasion added to which the world gave m de st remy as a favoured lover to the duchess de lucenay and this circumstance greatly excited the curiosity of rodolph the viscount de st remy conducted by the count de blank now approached 
he was an exceedingly handsome young man of about twenty-five years of age tall and slender with the most distingue air and prepossessing physiognomy his olive complexion had that rich soft glow of amber cast over its transparent surface so remarkable in the paintings of murillo his glossy black hair parted over his left temple was worn smooth over his forehead and fell in light and easy curls down the sides of his face almost concealing the pale well-shaped ear the deep dark eyelash contrasted well with the clear eye it shaded the crystal of which was tinged with that blue cast which bestows so much and such charming expression to the indian eye by a singular caprice of nature the thick silky moustache which graced his lip was the only ornament of a similar description visible on his countenance the chin and cheeks being smooth as those of a young maiden perhaps it might be vanity which dictated the narrow black satin cravat placed so low as to reveal the perfect contour of a throat which for whiteness and symmetrical roundness might have furnished a model for the artist's studio the long ends of his cravat were confined by a single pearl inestimable for its size the beauty of its shape and the splendour of its colour so vivid that an opal could scarcely have rivalled its continued prismatic changes the perfect taste and the exquisite style of m de saint-remy harmonized well with the magnificent simplicity of this jewel once seen the face and figure of m de saint-remy was never forgotten so entirely did it differ from the usual style of elegant he spared no expense in procuring the most faultless turnout and his carriages and horses were everywhere cited as models of taste and correct judgment he played high but skilfully while the annual amount of his betting book was never less than from two to three thousand louis the costly elegance of his mansion in the rue du chaillot was everywhere spoken of and admired there he gave the most exquisite dinner parties the highest play followed and the hospitable host would lose large and heavy sums with the most perfect indifference though it was known that his fortune had been dissipated long ago all the viscount's property had been derived from his mother while his father lived in utter seclusion in the wilds of anjou upon an income of the most slender description by way of accounting for the unbounded expenditure of m de saint-remy many among the envious or ill-natured referred as sarah had done to the large fortune of the duchess de lucenay but they forgot that setting aside the infamy of the idea m de lucenay would naturally direct the disposal of his wife's property and that m de saint-remy's annual expenses were at least two hundred thousand francs suspicions were entertained of his being deeply indebted to imprudent money-lenders for saint-remy had no further inheritance to look forward to others again spoke of his great successes on the turf and hinted in an undertone dark stories of training grounds and jockeys bribed by him to make the horses against which he had betted largely lose but by far the greater number of the crowd by which saint-remy was surrounded was content to eat his dinners and occasionally to win his rouleau without troubling themselves with conjectures as to how the one was provided and where the other came from by birth and education he was fully entitled to the rank he occupied in the fashionable world he was lively witty brave a most amusing companion obliging and complacent to the wishes of others he gave first-rate bachelor dinners and afterwards took every bet that was offered him what more was required to secure his popularity he was an universal favourite with the fair sex and could boast the most unvaried success in all his love affairs he was young handsome gallant and unsparingly munificent upon all occasions where opportunities occurred of marking his devotion towards the high-bred females with whom he associated in the grand monde in a word thanks to the general infatuation he excited the air of mystery thrown over the source of the pactolus from which he derived his golden supplies rather embellished him with a certain mysterious charm which seemed but to add to his attractions sometimes it would be said with a careless smile what a fellow that saint-remy is he must have discovered the philosopher's stone to be able to go to the pace he does and when it was known that he had caused himself to be attached to the legation of france to the court of gerolstein there were not wanting voices to assert that it was a devilish good way of making an honourable retreat such was m de saint-remy allow me said the count de Blanc, presenting m de saint-remy to introduce to your royal highness the viscount de saint-remy attached to the embassy of gerolstein the viscount bowed profoundly saying may i trust your royal highness would deign to pardon my impatience in requesting the honour of this introduction during the present evening 
i am perhaps unduly hasty in my wishes to secure a gratification i have so long aspired to it will give me much pleasure my lord to welcome you to gerolstein do you propose going thither immediately your royal highness being in paris diminishes very materially my desire to do so i fear the peaceful contrast of our german courts will scarcely assort with a life of parisian fashion such as you have always been accustomed to permit me to assure your royal highness that the gracious kindness you have now shown me and which it shall be my study to merit a continuance of in gerolstein would of itself far outweigh any attractions paris may have had for me it will not be my fault my lord should you see cause to alter your sentiments when at gerolstein a slight inclination of rodolph's head announced that the presentation was concluded upon which the viscount bowed and retired the prince a practised physiognomist was subject to involuntary likes and dislikes upon the first interview with an individual and these impulses were in his case almost invariably borne out by after circumstances his first sensation after the exchange of the very few words we have related between himself and saint Remy was an unaccountable feeling of repugnance and aversion for the gay and fascinating young man to his eye the handsome features wore a sinister look and danger seemed to lurk even in his honeyed words and smooth polished manner we shall hereafter meet m de saint Remy under circumstances differing widely and fearfully from the splendour of the position he occupied at his first interview with rodolph it will then be seen how far these presentiments were ill or well founded the presentation over rodolph in deep meditation upon the singular rencontre effected by the hand of chance bent his steps toward the winter garden it was now the hour of supper and the rooms were nearly deserted the most retired spot in the hot-house was at the end of a clump of trees placed against the corner of a wall and an enormous banana covered with climbing plants effectually concealed a small side door masked by the trellis and conducting to the banqueting hall by a long corridor this door which was scarcely a yard distant from the tree above mentioned had been left temporarily ajar sheltered by this verdant screen rodolph seated himself and was soon lost in a profound reverie when the sound of a well-known voice pronouncing his name made rodolph start it was sarah who seated with her brother tom on the other side of the clump of trees which effectually hid rodolph from their view was conversing with him in the english language the prince listened attentively and the following dialogue ensued the marquise has just gone to show herself for a few minutes at baron de nerval's ball said sarah she has luckily quitted this place without once having an opportunity of exchanging a word with rodolph who has been looking everywhere for her i still dread the influence he possesses over her even unknown to herself an influence it has cost me so much labour and difficulty to combat and partly to destroy however to-morrow will rid me of any further fears of a rival who if not effectually destroyed might so powerfully derange and overthrow my plans listen to me brother for it is of serious matters i would speak to you to-morrow witnesses the eternal ruin of my hated rival you are mistaken sarah answered tom's well-remembered voice odolph never loved the marquise of that i am certain your jealous fears mislead you it is time returned sarah that i enlightened you on this subject many things occurred during your last journey and as it is necessary to take decisive steps even earlier than i had expected nay this very night so soon as we quit this place it becomes indispensably necessary we should take serious counsel together happily we are now quite alone for the gay butterflies of the night have found fresh attraction around the supper-tables now then brother give your close and undivided attention to what i am about to say proceed i am all in patience well before clemence d'harville met rodolph i feel assured the passion of love was wholly unknown to her for what reason i have never been able to discover she entertains the most invincible repugnance and aversion towards her husband who perfectly adores her there is some deep mystery in this part of the business i have never succeeded in fathoming a thousand new and delightful emotions sprang up in the breast of clemence after she became acquainted with rodolph but i stifled her growing love by the most frightful disclosures or rather ingeniously invented calumnies concerning the prince still the void in her heart required an object to fill it and chance having thrown m charles robert in her way during a morning call she was making at my house she appeared struck with his appearance much after the manner in which we are attracted by a fine picture 
unfortunately however this man is as silly as he is handsome though he certainly has a very prepossessing tout ensemble i praised him enthusiastically to madame d'harville exalted the nobleness of his sentiments the elevation of his mind and as i knew her weak side i worked upon her sympathy and pity by representing him as loaded with every trouble and affliction unrelenting fate could heap upon a devoted but most innocent head i directed m robert to assume a melancholy and sentimental air to utter only deep sighs and to preserve a gloomy and unbroken silence in the presence of madame d'harville he carefully pursued the path marked out by me and thanks to his vocal skill his fine person and the constant expression of silent suffering so far engaged the interest of madame d'harville that ere long she transferred to my handsome friend the warm and sympathizing regard rodolph had first awakened do you comprehend me thus far perfectly proceed madame d'harville and robert met only upon terms of intimacy at my house to draw them more effectually together i projected devoting three mornings in the week to music and my mournful ally sighed softly as the breath of evening while turning over the leaves of the music ventured to utter a few impassioned words and even to slip two or three billets among the pieces he copied out for the marquise to practise at home i own i was more fearful of his epistolary efforts than even his powers of speech but a woman always looks indulgently upon the first declaration of love she receives so far therefore the written nonsense of my silly pupil did no harm for in obedience to my advice his billets doux were very laconic the great point was to obtain a rendezvous and this was no easy matter for clemence's principles were stronger than her love or rather her passion was not sufficiently deep to induce her to sacrifice those principles unknown even to herself the image of rodolph still filled her heart and seemed in a manner to preserve her from yielding to her weak fancy for m charles robert a fancy as i well knew far more imaginary than real but led on by my continual and exaggerated praises of this brainless apollo whom i persisted in describing as suffering under the daily increase of every imaginary evil i could invent clemence vanquished by the deep despair of her dejected adorer consented one day more from pity than love to grant him the rendezvous so long desired did she then make you her confidant she confessed to me her regard for m charles robert nothing more neither did i seek to learn more it would have annoyed and vexed her but as for him boiling over with love or rather intoxicated with pride he came voluntarily to impart his good fortune without however entrusting me either with the time or place of the intended meeting how then did you know it why karl by my order hovered about the door of m robert during the following day from an early hour nothing however transpired till the next day when our love-stricken youth proceeded in a fiacre to an obscure part of the town and finally alighted before a mean-looking house in the rue du temple there he remained for an hour and a half when he came out and walked away karl waited a long while to see whether any person followed m charles robert out of the house but no one came the marquise had evidently failed in her appointment this was confirmed to me on the morrow when the lover came to pour out all his rage and disappointment i advised him to assume even an increase of wretchedness and despair the plan succeeded the pity of clemence was again excited a fresh assignation was wrung from her but which she failed to keep equally with the former the third and last rendezvous however produced more decided effects madame d'harville positively going as far as the door of the house i have specified as the appointed place then repenting so rash a step returned home without having even quitted the humble fiacre in which she rode you may judge by all these capricious changes of purpose how this woman struggled to be free and wherefore why because and hence arises my bitter deadly hatred to clemence d'harville because the recollection of rodolph still lingers in her heart and with pertinacious love she shrinks from aught that she fancies breeze of preference for another thus shielding herself from harm or danger beneath his worshipped image now this very night the marquise has made a fresh assignation with m charles robert for to-morrow and this time i doubt not her punctuality the duc de lucenay has so grossly ridiculed this young man that carried away by pity for the humiliation of her admirer the marquise has granted that to compassion he would not else have obtained but this time i feel persuaded she will keep her word 
and be punctual to the appointed time and hour and how do you propose to act m charles robert is so perfectly unable to comprehend the delicacy of feeling which this evening dictated the marquise's resolution of meeting him that he is safe to rush with vulgar eagerness to the rendezvous and this will effectually ruin his plans for pity alone has instigated clemence to take this compromising step no love no infatuation has hurried her into a measure so fatal to her future resolution i know every turn of her mind and i am confident she will keep her appointment solely from a courageous idea of generous devotion but with a firm resolve not for one instant to forget her duties as a wife and mother now the coarse vulgar mind of m charles robert is sure to take the fullest advantage of the marquise's concession in his favour clemence will detest him from that instant and the illusion once destroyed which has bound herself and charles robert in bonds of imaginary sympathy she will fall again beneath the influence of her love for rodolph which i am certain still nestles in her heart well well i would have her for ever lost to rodolph whose high sense of honour and deep friendship for m d'harville i feel perfectly sure would not have proved equal to preventing his returning the love of clemence but i will so manage things that he shall henceforward look upon her with loathing and disgust as the guilty partner in a crime committed without his participation no no i know my man he might pardon the offence but never the being excluded from his share in it then do you propose apprising the husband of all that is going on so that the prince should learn the disgraceful circumstances from the publicity the affair would obtain i do and the thing is so much easier to accomplish as from what fell from clemence to-night i can learn that the marquis has vague and undefined suspicions without knowing on whom to fix them it is now midnight we shall almost directly leave the ball i will set you down at the first cafe we meet with whence you shall write m d'harville a minute account of his wife's love affair with the projected assignation of to-morrow with the time and place where it is arranged to take place oh but i forgot i didn't state that the place of meeting is number seventeen rue du temple and the time to-morrow at one o'clock the marquis is already jealous of clemence well he will be by this information surprise her under most suspicious circumstances the rest follows as a matter of course but this is a most abominable mode of action said satan coldly what my trusty and well-behaved brother and colleague growing scrupulous said sarah sarcastically this will never do suppose my modes of action are odious so be it i trample on all and everything that interferes with my designs agreed i do i shall till i have secured my purpose but let me ask you who thought of scruples when my destruction was aimed at who thought of me or my feelings let me ask you how have i been treated say no more sister say no more here is my hand and you may safely reckon upon my firm participation in all that concerns you even to writing the letter to m d'harville but still i say and repeat such conduct is horrible never mind sermonizing but say do you consent fully and entirely to what i wish you or do you not eh or nay since it must be so m d'harville shall this night be fully instructed as to all his wife's proceedings but what is that i fancied i heard some one on the other side of this thicket there was a rustling of leaves and branches said satan interrupting himself and speaking to sarah in a low and suppressed voice for heaven's sake cried sarah uneasily don't stop to talk about it but quick and examine the other side of this place satan rose made the tour of the clump of trees but saw no one rodolph had just disappeared by the side door of which we have before spoken i must have made a mistake said satan returning there is no appearance of any persons but ourselves being in this place i thought there could not possibly be now then sarah hear what i have to say on the subject of madame d'harville who i feel quite satisfied you make an object of unnecessary apprehension as far as it would be possible for her to interfere with your schemes the prince moreover has certain principles nothing would induce him to infringe i am infinitely more alarmed and with greater justice too as to what can have been his intentions in conducting that young girl to his farm at bouqueval five or six weeks ago he is constant in his superintendence of her health and comfort is having her well educated and moreover has been several times to see her now we are altogether ignorant who she is or where she came from 
she seems however to belong only to the humbler ranks of society still the exquisite style of her beauty the fact of the prince having worn the disguise he did when escorting her to the farm the increasing interest he seems to take in her welfare all go to prove that his regard for her is of no common description i have therefore in this affair anticipated your wishes but to remove this greater and as i believe more serious obstacle to our plans the utmost circumspection was requisite to obtain information respecting the lives and habits of these mysterious occupants of the farm and particularly concerning the girl herself i have been fortunate enough to learn nearly sufficient to point out what is to be done the moment for action has arrived a most singular chance threw that horrid old woman in my way to whom as you remember i once gave my address which she it seems has carefully preserved her connection with such persons as the robber who attacked us during our late visit to the cite will powerfully assist us all is provided for and preconsidered there can be no proof against us and besides if as seems evident this young creature belongs to the humblest class of society it is not very probable she will hesitate between our offers and the splendid prospect she may perchance picture to herself for the prince i have ascertained has preserved a strict incognito towards her but to-morrow shall decide the question otherwise we shall see we shall see and these two obstacles overcome then tom for our grand project there are many and serious obstacles in the way still they may be overcome and would it not be lucky chance if we could bring it to pass at the very moment when rodolph would be writhing under the double misery occasioned by the disclosure of madame d'harville's conduct and the disappearance of the creature for whom he chooses to evince so deep an interest would not that be an auspicious moment to persuade him that the daughter whose loss he daily more and more deplores still lives and then silence sister interrupted satan i hear the steps of the guests from the supper-table returning to resume the ball since you deem it expedient to apprise the marquis d'harville of the morrow's rendezvous let us depart it is past midnight the lateness of the hour in which the anonymous information will reach m d'harville will but tend still more to impress him with an idea of its importance and with these words tom and sarah quitted the splendid ball of the ambassadress of the court of blank end of chapter one part two read by celine major chapter two part one of the mysteries of paris volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter two part one the rendezvous determined at all risks to warn madame d'harville of the danger she was incurring rodolph had quitted the winter garden without waiting to hear the remainder of the conversation between sarah and her brother thus remaining ignorant of their designs against fleur de marie and of the extreme peril which threatened the poor girl but in spite of his earnest desire to apprise the marquise of the plot laid against her peace and honour he was unable to carry his design into execution for madame d'harville unable to bear up longer after the trying events of the evening had abandoned her original intention of visiting the entertainment given by madame de nerval and gone direct home this contretemps ruined his hopes nearly the whole of the company present at the ambassadress's ball had been invited to that of madame de nerval's and rodolph drove rapidly thither taking with him m de grand to whom he gave instructions to look for madame d'harville among the guests and to acquaint her that the prince having something of the utmost consequence to communicate to her without the least delay would walk onwards to the hotel d'harville and await her return home when he would say a few words at the carriage door while her servants were attending to the opening of the entrance gates after much time spent in fruitless endeavours to find madame d'harville de grand was compelled to return with the account of his ill success this failure made rodolph despair of being able now to save the marquise from impending ruin his first thought had been to warn her of the treachery intended and so prevent the statement of sarah which he had no means of keeping from the hands of m d'harville from obtaining the slightest credence alas it was now too late the infamous epistle dictated by the countess macgregor had reached the marquis d'harville shortly after midnight on the night in question it was morning and m d'harville continued slowly to pace his sleeping apartment the bed of which gave no indication of having been used during the night though the silken counterpane hung in fragments 
evidently proving that some powerful and devastating storm had possessed the mind of its owner the chamber in question was furnished with elegant simplicity its only ornaments consisting of a stand of modern arms and a range of shelves furnished with a well-chosen collection of books yet a sudden frenzy or the hand of ungovernable rage had reduced the quiet elegance which ordinarily reigned to a scene of frantic disorder chairs tables broken and overset the carpet strewed with fragments of the crystal lamp kept burning through the night the wax lights and gilded chandelier which had contained them lying around gave manifest evidence of a fearful scene m d'harville was about thirty years of age with a fine manly countenance whose usual expression was mild and prepossessing but now contracted haggard and livid he had not changed his dress since the preceding evening his throat was bare his waistcoat thrown open and on the torn and rumpled cambric of his shirt front were drops of blood his rich dark hair which generally fell in curls around his face now hung in tangled wildness over his pale countenance wholly buried in the misery of his own thoughts with folded arms drooping head and fixed bloodshot eyes m d'harville continued to pace his chamber then stopping opposite his fireplace in which spite of the almost unendurable severity of the frost of the past night the fire had been allowed to expire he took from the marble mantelpiece the following brief note which he continued to read over and over with the most eager attention by the wan pale light of the cold glimmer of an early winter morning to-morrow at one o'clock your wife has appointed to meet her favoured lover go to the rue du temple number seventeen and you will obtain every requisite confirmation of this intelligence from one who pities you whilst reading these words perused with such deep anguish and sickness of heart so many times through the long midnight hours the blue cold lips of m d'harville appeared convulsively to spell each syllable of this fatal billet at this moment the chamber door opened and a servant entered the man who now made his appearance was old even grey-headed but the expression of his countenance was frank and honest the noise of the man entering disturbed not the marquis from his bitter contemplations he merely turned his head without altering his position but still grasped the letter in his clenched hands what do you want inquired he sternly of the servant the man instead of answering continued to gaze with an air of painful surprise at the disordered state of the room then regarding his master more attentively exclaimed blood on your clothes my lord my lord how is this you have hurt yourself and all alone too why my lord did you not summon me as of old when these attacks came on be gone i entreat your lordship's pardon but your fire is out the cold is intense indeed i must remind your lordship that after your late your will you be silent leave me i say pray do not be angry my lord replied the trembling valet but if your lordship pleases to recollect you appointed m doublet to be here to-day at half-past ten and he is now waiting with the notary quite proper said the marquis with a bitter smile when a man is rich he ought he should look carefully to his affairs fortune is a fine thing a very fine thing or would be if it could purchase happiness then resuming a cold and collected manner he added show m doublet into my study i have done so my lord marquis then give me my clothes quick i am in haste i shall be going out shortly i but if your lordship would only do as i desire you joseph said m d'harville in a more gentle tone then added is your lady stirring yet i have not yet heard her ladyship's bell my lord marquis let me know when she rings i will my lord heaven and earth man how slow you are exclaimed m d'harville whose raging thoughts almost shaped him into madness summon philip to assist you you will keep me all day my lord please to allow me to set matters a little straight first replied joseph sorrowfully i would much rather no one but myself witness the state of your chamber or they would wonder and talk about it because they could not understand what has taken place during the night my lord and if they were to find out it would be a most shocking affair would it not asked m d'harville in a tone of gloomy irony thank god my lord not a soul in the house has the least suspicion of it no one suspects it repeated m d'harville despondingly no one that's well for her at least well let us hope to keep the secret 
and while joseph was occupying himself in repairing the havoc in his master's apartment d'harville walked up to the stage of arms we before mentioned examined them with an expression of deep interest then turning towards joseph with a sinister smile said i hope you have not omitted to clean the guns which are placed at the top of the stand i mean those in my hunting case i had not your lordship's orders to do so replied the astonished servant you had sir and have neglected them i humbly assure you my lord they must be in a fine state your lordship will please to bear in mind that it is scarcely a month since they were regularly repaired and put in order for use by the gunsmith never mind as soon as i am dressed reach down my shooting-case i will examine the guns myself i may very possibly go out shooting either to-morrow or next day i will reach them down directly my lord the chamber being by this time replaced in its ordinary state a second valet de chambre was summoned to assist joseph his toilet concluded m d'harville repaired to his study where the steward m doublet and his lawyer's clerk were awaiting him we have brought the agreement that my lord marquis may hear it read over said the bowing clerk my lord will then only have to sign it and the affair is concluded have you perused it m doublet i have my lord attentively in that case i will affix my signature at once the necessary forms completed the clerk withdrew when m doublet rubbing his hands and looking triumphantly exclaimed now then by this last addition to your lordship's estates your manorial property cannot be less than a hundred and twenty-six thousand francs per annum in round numbers and permit me to say my lord marquis that a rent-roll of a hundred and twenty-six thousand francs per annum is of no common occurrence nowadays i am a happy man am i not m doublet a hundred and twenty-six thousand livres per annum surely the man owning such an income must be blessed indeed sorrow or care cannot reach him through so golden a shield and that is wholly dependent of my lord's funded property amounting at least to two millions more or reckoning exactly i know what you would say without reckoning my other blessings and comforts why heaven be praised your lordship is as rich in all earthly blessings as in revenue not a precious gift but it has been largely bestowed upon you ay and such as even money will not buy youth uninterrupted health the power of enjoying every happiness amongst which or rather at the head of which said m doublet gracefully smiling and gallantly bowing place that of being the husband of so sweet a lady as madame la marquise and the parent of a lovely little girl who might be mistaken for a cherubim m d'harville cast a look of gloomy mistrust on the poor steward who revelling in his own ecstasy at seeing the princely rent roll committed to his charge exceeding all others in magnificent amount was far from perceiving the scowling brow of his master thus congratulated on being the happiest man alive when to his own view a verier wretch or more complete bankrupt in happiness existed not striking m doublet familiarly on the shoulder and breaking into a wild ironical laugh m d'harville rejoined then you think that with income of two hundred and sixty thousand livres a wife like mine and a daughter resembling a cherubim a man has nothing more to wish for nay my lord replied the steward with honest zeal you have to still wish for the blessing of lengthened days that you may be spared to see mademoiselle married as happily as yourself ah my lord i may not hope to see it but i should be thankful to witness you and my honoured lady surrounded by your grandchildren ay and great-grandchildren too why not excellent m doublet a regular bossus and philemon idea you have always a capital illustration to your ideas you are too good to me my lord has your lordship any further orders for me none stay though what cash have you in hand twenty nine thousand three hundred and odd francs for current expenses my lord marquis but there is a heavy sum at the bank belonging to this quarter's income well bring me twenty thousand francs in gold and should i have gone out give them to joseph for me does your lordship wish them for this morning i do within an hour the gold shall be here you have nothing else to say to me my lord no m doublet a hundred and twenty-six thousand francs per annum wholly unencumbered repeated the steward as he was about to quit the room this is a glorious day for me to see i almost feared at one time that we should not secure this desirable property your lordship's most humble servant 
i take my leave good morning monsieur doublet as the door closed upon the steward m d'harville overcome with the mental agony he had repressed thus far threw himself into an armchair leaned his elbows on the desk before which he sat and covering his face with his hands for the first time since receiving the fatal billet gave vent to a flood of hot burning tears cruel mockery of fate cried he at length to have made me rich but to have given me only shame and dishonour to place within the gilded frame the perjury of clemence the disgrace which will descend upon my innocent child can i suffer this or shall i for the sake of her unoffending offspring spare the guilty mother from the opprobrium of an exposure then rising suddenly from his seat with sparkling eyes and clenched teeth he cried in a deep determined voice no no blood blood the fearful protection from laughter and derision ah full well i can now comprehend her coldness her antipathy wretched wretched woman then stopping all at once as though melted by some tender recollection he resumed in a hoarse tone aversion alas too well i know its cause i inspire her with loathing with disgust then after a lengthened silence he cried in a voice broken by sighs yet was it my fault or my misfortune should she have wronged me thus for a calamity beyond my power to avert surely i am a more fitting object for her pity than scorn and hatred again rekindling into his excited feelings he reiterated nothing but blood the blood of both can wash out this guilty stain doubtless he the favoured lover has been informed why she flies her husband's arms this latter thought redoubled the fury of the marquis he elevated his tightly compressed hands toward heaven as though invoking its vengeance then passing his burning fingers over his eyes as he recollected the necessity that existed for concealing his emotion from the servants of his establishment he returned to his sleeping apartment with an appearance of perfect tranquillity there he found joseph well in what state are the guns in perfect order please to examine them my lord i came for the purpose of so doing has your lady yet rung i do not know my lord then inquire directly the servant had quitted the room m d'harville hastily took from the gun-case a small powder flask some balls and caps then locking the case put the key in his pocket then going to the stand of arms he took from it a pair of moderate-sized manton's pistols loaded them and placed them without difficulty in the pockets of his morning wrapper joseph returned with the intimation that madame d'harville was in her dressing-room has your lady ordered her carriage my lord i heard mademoiselle juliette say to the head coachman when he came to inquire her ladyship's orders for the day that as it was cold dry walking if your ladyship went out at all she would prefer going on foot very well stay i forgot i shall not go out hunting before to-morrow or probably next day desire williams to look the small travelling britchka carefully over do you understand perfectly my lord it shall be attended to will not your lordship require a stick no pray tell me is there not a hackney-coach stand near here quite close my lord in the rue de lille after a moment's hesitation the marquis continued go and inquire of mademoiselle juliette whether madame d'harville can see me for a few minutes joseph obeyed yes murmured the marquis i will see the cause of all my misery my disgrace i will contemplate the guilty mask beneath which the impure heart conceals its adulterous designs i will listen to the false lips that speak the words of innocence while deep dishonour lurks in the candid smile a smile that seemed to me as that of an angel yet tis an appalling spectacle to watch the words the looks of one who breathing only the sentiments of a chaste wife and mother is about to sully your name with one of those deep deadly stains which can only be washed out in blood fool that i am to give her the chance of again bewildering my senses she will look at me with her accustomed sweetness and candour greet me all guilty as she is with the same pure smile she bestows upon her child as kneeling at her lap it lisps its early prayer that look those eyes mirrors of the soul the more modest and pure the glance d'harville shuddered with contempt 
the greater must be the innate corruption and falsehood alas she has proved herself a consummate dissembler and i i have been the veriest dupe only let me consider with what sentiments must that woman look upon me if just previous to her meeting with her favoured lover i pay her my accustomed visit and express my usual devotion and love for her the young the virtuous wife the tender sensible and devoted mother as until this wretched moment i would have died to prove her can i dare i trust myself in her presence with the knowledge of her being but too impatient for the arrival of that blessed hour which conveys her to her guilty rendezvous and infamous paramour o oh, clemence clemence you in whom all my hopes and fondest affections were placed is this a just return no 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 again repeated m d'harville with rapidly returning excitement false treacherous woman i will not see you i will not trust my ears to your feigned words nor you my child at the sight of your innocent countenance i should unman myself and compromise my just revenge quitting his apartment m d'harville instead of repairing to those of the marquise contented himself with leaving a message for her through mademoiselle juliette to the effect that he wished a short conversation with madame d'harville but that being obliged to go out just then he should be glad if it assorted with madame la marquise's perfect convenience to breakfast with her at twelve o'clock and so said the unhappy m d'harville fancying that after twelve o'clock i shall be safe at home she will consider herself more at liberty to follow out her own plans he then repaired to the coach-stand contiguous to his mansion and summoned a vehicle from the ranks now coachy said he affecting to disguise his rank what's o'clock all right master said the man drawing off to the side of the footway where am i to drive to let's have a right understanding and a look at the clock why it's as close and half after eleven as may be now then drive to the corner of the rue saint dominique and wait at the end of the garden wall which runs along there do you understand yes yes i know m d'harville then drew down the blinds of the fiacre the coachman drove on and soon arrived opposite the hotel d'harville from which point of observation it was impossible for any person to enter or quit the house without the marquis having a full view of them one o'clock was the hour fixed in the note and with his eyes riveted on the entrance gates of the mansion the marquis waited in painful suspense absorbed in a whirl of fearful thoughts and maddening conjectures time stole on imperceptibly twelve o'clock reverberated from the dome of st thomas aquinas when the door opened slowly at the hotel d'harville and madame d'harville herself came timidly forth already exclaimed the unhappy husband how punctual she is she fears to keep him waiting cried the marquis with a mixture of irony and savage rage the cold was excessive the pavement hard and dry clemence was dressed in a black velvet bonnet covered with a veil of the same colour and a thickly wadded pelisse of dark ruby satin a large shawl of dark blue cashmere fell to the very hem of her pelisse which she lightly and gracefully held up while crossing the street thanks to this movement the taper foot and graceful ankle of madame d'harville cased in an exquisitely fitting boot of black satin were exposed to view it was strange that amid the painful and bewildering ideas that crowded the brain of d'harville he should have found one thought to waste upon the beauty of his wife's foot but so it was and at the moment that it was about to separate them for ever to his eager gaze that fairy foot and well-turned ankle had never looked so charming and then as by a rapid train of thought he recalled the matchless loveliness of his wife and as he had ever believed till now her purity her mental graces he groaned aloud as he remembered that another was preferred to him and that the light figure that glided on before his fixed gaze was but the hollow spectre of fallen goodness a lost degraded creature hastening to steep her husband and infant in irremediable disgrace for the indulging of a base and guilty passion even in that wretched moment he felt how dearly how exclusively he had loved her and for the first time during the blow which had fallen on him he knew that he mourned the lovely woman almost equally with the virtuous mother and chaste wife a cry of rage and mingled fury escaped him as he pictured the rapture of her meeting with the lover of her choice 
and a sharp darting pain quivered through his heart as he remembered that clemence with all her youth and beauty her countless charms both of body and mind was lost to him for ever end of chapter two part one read by celine major chapter two part two of the mysteries of paris volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter two part two hitherto his passionate grief had been unmixed by any alloy of self he had bewailed the sanctity of the marriage vow trampled under foot the abandonment of all sworn and sacred duties but his sufferings of rage jealousy and regret almost overpowered him and with much difficulty was he able to command his voice sufficiently to say to the coachman while partially drawing up the blind do you see that lady in the blue shawl and black bonnet walking along by the wall yes yes i see her safe enough well then go slowly along and keep up with her should she go to the coach-stand i had you from pull up and when she has got into a fiacre follow it wherever it goes all right i understand now this is what i call a good joke m d'harville had conjectured rightly madame d'harville repaired directly to the coach-stand and beckoning a fiacre off the stand instantly got in and drove off closely followed by the vehicle containing her husband they had proceeded but a very short distance when the coachman took the road to the church of st thomas aquinas and to the surprise of m d'harville pulled up directly in front what is this for what are you about why master the lady you told me to follow has just alighted here and a smart tidy leg and foot of her own she has got her dress somehow caught so you see i couldn't help having a peep no how this is downright good fun though this is a thousand varied thoughts agitated m d'harville one minute he fancied that his wife fearing pursuit had taken this step to escape detection then hope whispered that the letter which had given him such uneasiness might after all be only an infamous calumny for if guilty what could be gained by this false assumption of piety would it not be a species of sacrilegious mockery at this suggestion a bright ray of hope shot across the troubled mind of m d'harville arising from the striking contrast between clemence's present occupation and the crime alleged as her motive for quitting her home alas this consolatory illusion was speedily destroyed leaning in at the open window the coachman observed i say master that nice little woman you are after has got back into her coach then follow quickly i'm off now this is what i call downright good fun capital hang me if it ain't the vehicle reached the quay the hotel de ville the rue st avoie and at last rue du temple i say said the coachman turning round to speak to m d'harville from his seat master just look my mate there has stopped at number seventeen we are about at thirteen shall i stop here or go on to seventeen stop here i say looky you'll lose your pretty lady she has gone into the alley leading to number seventeen open the door i'm coming sir and quickly following the steps of his wife m d'harville entered the obscure passage up which she had disappeared madame d'harville however had so far the start as to have entered the house previously attracted by the most devouring curiosity madame pipelet with her melancholy alfred and her friend the oyster woman were huddled close together on the sill at the lodge door the staircase was so dark that a person just emerging from the daylight into the gloom of the passage could not discern a single step of it and madame d'harville agitated and almost sinking with apprehension found herself constrained to apply to madame pipelet for further advice how to proceed saying in a low tremulous voice which way must i turn madame to find the staircase of the house stop if you please pray whom do you want i wish to go to the apartments of m charles madame monsieur who repeated the old woman feigning not to have heard her but in reality to afford sufficient leisure to her husband and her friend thoroughly to scrutinize the unhappy woman's countenance even through the folds of her thick veil m charles madame repeated clemence in a low trembling tone and bending down her head 
so as to escape the rude and insolent examination to which her features were subjected ah monsieur charles very well you should have spoken so that no one could hear you well my pretty dear if you want monsieur charles and a good-looking fellow he is as ever won a woman's heart go straight on and the door will stare you in the face hey 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 laughed out the old woman shaking her fat sides with spiteful glee it seems he has not waited for nothing this time success to love and love-makings and a merry end to it the marquise ready to sink with confusion began slowly to grope her way up the dingy staircase i say bawled out the old shell-fish woman our commandant knows what he is about don't he leave him alone to choose a pretty girl his marm is a regular swell ain't she had it not been requisite for her to run the gauntlet of the trio who occupied the entrance door madame d'harville ready to sink with shame and terror would gladly have retraced her steps she made another effort and at last reached the landing-place where to her unutterable consternation and surprise she saw rodolph waiting impatiently her arrival instantly flying to meet her he hastily placed a purse in her hand saying in a hurried manner your husband knows all and is now following your very steps at this instant the sharp tones of madame pipelet were heard crying out where are you going to sir tis he exclaimed rodolph and then almost forcing madame d'harville up the second staircase he added in a rapid manner make all haste to the very top of the house on the fifth floor you will find a wretched family named morel remember your sole business in coming hither was to relieve their distress i tell you sir screamed madame pipelet that unless you tell me your name you shall trample over me as they walked over our brave men at waterloo before i let you pass having from the entrance to the alley observed madame d'harville stop to speak to the portress the marquis had likewise prepared himself to pass through some sort of questioning i belong to the lady who just now entered said the marquis bless me exclaimed madame pipelet looking the picture of wonderment why that of course is a satisfactory answer you can pass on if you please hearing an unusual stir m charles robert had set the door of his apartments ajar and rodolphe unwilling to be recognized by m d'harville whose quick searching eye might have detected him spite of the murkiness of the staircase hearing him rapidly ascending the stairs just as he reached the landing-place dashed into the chamber of the astonished commandant locking the door after him m charles robert magnificently attired in his robe de chambre of scarlet damask with orange-coloured stripes and greek cap of embroidered velvet was struck with astonishment at the unexpected appearance of rodolph whom he had not seen the preceding evening at the embassy and who was upon the present occasion very plainly dressed what is the meaning of this intrusion asked he at length assuming a tone of killing haughtiness be silent replied rodolph and there was that in his voice and manner that charles robert obeyed even in spite of his own determination to strike terror into the bold invader of his private moments a violent and continued noise as of some heavy substance falling from one stair to the other resounded through the dull silence of the gloomy staircase unhappy man he has murdered her exclaimed rodolph murdered ejaculated m charles robert turning very pale for the love of heaven what is all this about but without heeding his inquiry rodolph partially opened the door and discovered little tortillard half rolling half limping down the stairs holding in his hand the red silk purse rodolph had just given to madame d'harville tortillard with another scrambling shuffle disappeared at the bottom of the last flight of stairs the light step of madame d'harville and the heavier tread of her husband as he continued his pursuit of her from one story to another could be distinctly heard somewhat relieved of his worst fears yet unable to make out by what chance the purse so recently committed to madame d'harville's hands should have been transferred to those of tortillard rodolph said authoritatively to m robert do not think of quitting your apartments for the next hour i request upon my life and soul that is a pretty thing to say to a gentleman in his own house replied m robert in an impatient and wrathful tone i ask you again what is the meaning of all this who the devil are you sir and how dare you dictate to me a gentleman m d'harville is informed of everything 
has followed his wife to your very door and is now pursuing her to the upper part of the house god bless me here's a situation exclaimed charles robert with an appearance of utter consternation but what is to be done what is the use of her going upstairs and how will she manage to get down again unobserved remain where you are neither speak nor move until the portress comes to you rejoined rodolph who hastened to give his final instructions to madame pipelet leaving the commandant a prey to the most alarming apprehensions well well cried madame pipelet her face radiant with chuckling exultation there's rare sport going on the lady who came to visit my fine gentleman on the first floor has been followed by another gentleman who seems rather in a passion the husband of that silly young creature i make no doubt directly the truth flashed across me i tells him to go straight up for thinks i he'll be sure to murder our commandant that'll make a deal of talk in the neighbourhood and folks will come crowding to see the house just as they did at number thirty six after the man was killed there lord i wonder the fighting has not begun yet i have been listening to hear them set to but i can't catch the least sound my dear madame pipelet will you do me a great favour said rodolph putting five louis into her hand when this lady comes downstairs ask her how she found the poor morels tell her she has performed an act of real charity in coming to see them according to her promise the last time she called to inquire respecting them madame pipelet looked first at the money and then at rodolph with an air of petrified astonishment what am i to do with this money inquired she at length do you give it to me ah i see this handsome lady then does not come altogether for the commandant the gentleman who followed her was her husband as you justly supposed but being warned in time the poor lady went straight on to the morels as though her only business here was to afford them succour now do you understand i should think i did clear as noonday a nod is as good as a wink as the old woman said i know you want me to help you cheat the husband lord bless you i am up to all those things quick as lightning silent as the grave go along with you i'm a regular good hand at keeping husbands in the dark you might fancy i'd been used to it all my life but tell me the huge hat of monsieur pipelet was here observed sending its dark shadow across the floor of the lodge anastasie said alfred gravely you are like monsieur Cesar bradamanti you have no respect for anything or anybody and let me tell you that there are subjects that should never be made the subject of a jest even amongst the most familiar acquaintances nonsense my old darling don't stand there rolling up your eyes and looking about as wise as a pig in a pound you know well enough i was only joking you know well enough that no living soul beneath the canopy of heaven can ever say i gave him a liberty but that'll do so let's talk of this good gentleman's business suppose i do go out of my usual way to save this young lady i'm sure i do it solely to oblige our new lodger who for his generosity may well deserve to be called the king of lodgers then turning towards rodolph she added you shall see how cleverly i will go to work just hide yourself there in that corner behind the curtain quick quick i hear them coming rodolph had scarcely time to conceal himself ere monsieur and madame d'harville descended the stairs the features of the marquis shone with happiness mingled with a confused and astonished expression while the countenance of his wife as she hung on his arm looked calm but pale well my good lady cried madame pipelet going out of her lodge to address her as she descended the last stair how did you find the poor creatures i mean the morels ah i doubt not such a sight made your heart ache god knows your charity was well bestowed i told you the other day when you called to inquire about them what a state of starvation and misery they were in be assured kind lady these poor things are fit objects of your bounty you will never have to regret coming to this out-of-the-way place to examine into their case they really are deserving all your kindness don't you think so alfred alfred the strictness of whose ideas touching a due regard for all conjugal duties made him revolt at the thoughts of helping to deceive a husband 
replied only by a sort of grumbling sound as vague as discordant please to excuse my husband madame resumed madame pipelet he has got the cramp in his stomach and cannot speak loud enough to be understood or he would tell you as well as myself that the poor people you have so fortunately relieved will pray of the almighty night and day to bless and reward you my worthy lady m d'harville gazed on his wife with feelings approaching to adoration as he exclaimed angel of goodness how has base slander dared to disturb your heavenly work an angel repeated madame pipelet that she is and one of the very best heaven could send there is not a better let us return home i entreat said madame d'harville who was suffering acutely under the restraint she had put herself since entering the house and now that the necessity for exertion was over found her strength rapidly forsaking her instantly replied the marquis at the instant of their emerging into the open air from the obscurity of the alley m d'harville observing the pale looks of his wife said tenderly ah clemence i have deep cause to solicit your pity and forgiveness alas my lord said the marquis sighing deeply which of us has not need of pardon rodolph quitted his hiding-place deeply ruminating upon so terrible a scene thus intermingled with absurdity and coarseness and pondering over the curious termination to a drama the commencement of which had called forth such different passions well now exclaimed madame pipelet you must say i played my part well didn't i send that donkey of a husband home with longer ears than he came out with lord bless you he'll put his wife under a glass case and worship her from this day forward poor dear gentleman i really could not help feeling sorry for him oh but about your furniture monsieur rodolph it has not come yet i am now going to see about it by the by you had better go and inform the commandant that he may venture out true i'll go and let the caged bird out but what stuff and nonsense for him to hire apartments of no more use to him than they are to the king of prussia he is a fine fellow he is with his paltry twelve francs a month this is the fourth time he has been made a fool of rodolph quitted the house and madame pipelet turning to her husband said with a chuckling laugh now alfred the commandant's turn has come now for it i mean to have a jolly good laugh at my gentleman up and dressed for nothing arrived at the apartments of m charles robert the portress rang the bell the door was opened by the commandant himself commandant said anastasie giving him a military salute by placing the back of her little fat hand against the front of her wig i have come to set you free your friends have gone away arm in arm happy as doves under your very nose well you are out of a nice mess thanks to m rodolph you ought to stand something very handsome to him for all he has done upon the present occasion then this slim individual with the mustachios is called m rodolph is he exactly so neither more nor less and who and what is the fellow fellow indeed cried madame pipelet in a wrathful voice he is as good as other men better than some i could mention why he is a travelling clerk but the very king of lodgers for though he has only one room he does not haggle and beat folks down not he why he gave me six francs for doing for him six francs mind i say without a word think of that without ever offering me a sou less oh he is a lodger i wish other people were at all like him there there that's enough take the key shall i light the fire to-morrow commandant no next day no no don't bother me i say commandant if you recollect i warned you that you would have your trouble for your pains m charles robert threw a glance at his grinning tormentor that spoke of annihilation at least and dashingly furiously by her quitted the house wondering much how a mere clerk should have become acquainted with his assignation with the marquise d'harville as the commandant left the alley tortillard came hobbling along well what do you want said madame pipelet has the borgnes been to call upon me asked the young scamp without attending to the portress's question the chouette 
no you ugly monster what should she come for why to take me with her into the country to be sure said tortillard swinging on the lodge gate and what does your master say to it oh father managed all that he sent this morning to monsieur bradamanti to ask him to give me leave to go into the country the country the country sang or rather screamed the amiable scion of monsieur bras rouge beating time most melodiously on the window panes will you leave off you young rascal or are you going to break my window oh here comes a coach oh 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 shrieked the urchin it is my dear chouette oh how nice the ride in a coach and looking through the window they saw reflected upon the red blind of the opposite glass the hideous profile of the borgnes she beckoned to tortillard who ran out to her the coachman descended from his box and opened the door tortillard sprang into the vehicle which instantly drove off another person beside the chouette was in the carriage in the farther corner and wrapped in an old cloak with a furred collar his features shrouded by a black silk cap pulled down over his brows sat the schoolmaster his inflamed lids formed a horrible contrast with the white globeless space beneath and this fearful spectacle was rendered still more hideous by the action of the severe cold upon his seamed and frightful countenance now small boy squat yourself down on the pins of my man you'll serve to keep him warm said the borgnes to tortillard who crouched like a dog close to the feet of the schoolmaster and the chouette now then my coves said the driver on we go to the ken at bouqueval don't we la chouette you shall see whether i can tool a drag or not and keep your hands on the move my fine fellow for we must get hold of the girl to-night all right my blindin we'll go to the pace shall i give you a hint said the schoolmaster what about why cut it fine as you pass by the nabs at the barrier the meeting might lead to disagreeable recollections it is not every old acquaintance it is worth while to renew our friendship with you have been wanted at the barriers for some time i'll keep my weather eye open replied the driver getting on his box it need scarcely be told after this specimen of slang that the coachman was a robber one of the schoolmaster's worthy associates the vehicle then quitted the rue du temple two hours afterwards towards the closing of a winter's day the vehicle containing the chouette the schoolmaster and tortillard stopped before a wooden cross marking out the sunken and lonely road which conducted to the farm at bouqueval where the goualeuse remained under the kind protection of madame georges end of chapter two part two read by celine major chapter three of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter three an idol the hour of five had just struck from the church clock of the little village of bouqueval the cold was intense the sky clear the sun sinking slowly behind the vast leafless woods which crowned the heights of ecouen cast a purple hue over the horizon and sent its faint sloping rays across the extensive plains white and hard with winter's frost in the country each season has its own distinctive features its own peculiar charm at times the dazzling snow changes the whole scene into immense landscapes of purest alabaster exhibiting their spotless beauties to the reddish grey of the sky then may be seen in the glimmer of twilight either ascending or descending the hill a benighted farmer returning to his habitation his horse cloak and hat are covered with the falling snow bitter is the cold biting the north wind dark and gloomy the approaching night but what cares he there amid those leafless trees he sees the bright taper burning in the window of his cheerful home while from the tall chimney a column of dark smoke rolls upwards through the flaky shower that descends and speaks to the toil-worn farmer of blazing hearth and humble meal prepared by kind affection to welcome him after the fatigues of his journey then the rustic gossip by the fireside on which the faggot burns and crackles and a peaceful comfortable night's rest amid the whistling of the winds and the barking of the various dogs at the different farms scattered around with the answering cry from the distant watchdog daylight opens upon a scene of fairyland 
surely the tiny elves have been celebrating some grand fete and have left some of their adornments behind them for on each branch hang long spirals of crystal glittering in the rays of a winter's sun with all the prismatic brilliancy of the diamond the damp rich soil of the arable land is laid down in furrows where hides the timid hare in her form or the speckled partridge runs merrily here and there is heard the melancholy tinkling of the sheep-bell hanging from the neck of some important leader of the numerous flocks scattered over the virgin heights and turfy valleys of the neighbourhood while carefully wrapped in his dark grey cloak the shepherd seated under shelter of those knotted trunks and interlaced branches chants his cheerful lay while his fingers are busily employed weaving a basket of rushes occasionally a more animated scene presents itself distant echo gives out the faint sound of the hunting horn and the cry of hounds suddenly a frightened deer bursts from the neighbouring forest stands for a few seconds in terrified alarm upon the frozen plain then darts onward and is quickly lost amid the thickets on the opposite side the trampling of horses the barking of dogs are rapidly brought nearer by the breeze and now in their turn a pack of dogs with brown and tawny spotted skins issue from the brushwood from which the frightened deer but just now came they run eagerly over the sterile ground the fallow fields with noses closely pointed to the ground they pursue with loud cries the traces left by the flying deer at their heels come the hunters in their scarlet coats bending over the necks of their swift steeds they encourage their dogs by their voices mingled with the notes of the horn swift as lightning the brilliant cortege passes on the noise decreases by degrees all is still dogs horses and huntsmen are lost in the tangled mazes of the forest where the frightened stag had sought and found a hiding-place then peace and calm resumed their reign and the profound stillness of these vast plains was interrupted only by the monotonous song of the shepherd these sights these rustic views abounded in the environs of the village of bouqueval which spite of its proximity to paris was situated in a sort of desert to which there was no approach except by cross-roads concealed during the summer among the trees like a nest amid the sheltering foliage the farm which had become the home of the poor goualeuse was now utterly bereft of its leafy screen and entirely exposed to view the course of the little river now quite frozen over resembled a long silver riband stretched along the ever verdant meadows through which a number of fine cows were leisurely wending their way to their stable brought home by the approach of night flocks of pigeons were successfully arriving and perching on the peaked roof of the dove-house while the immense walnut tree that during the summer afforded an umbrageous screen both to the farmhouse and its numerous outbuildings stripped of its rich foliage exhibited only bare branches through which could plainly be discerned the tiled roof of the one and the thatched tops of the others overgrown with patches of moss of mingled green and dingy brown a heavy cart drawn by three strong sturdy horses with long thick manes and shining coats with blue collars ornamented with bells and tassels of red worsted was bringing in a load of wheat from a neighbouring rick this ponderous machine entered the courtyard by the large gate while immense flocks of sheep were pressing eagerly round the side entrances both men and beasts appeared impatient to escape from the severity of the cold and to enjoy the comfort of repose the horses neighed joyously at the sight of their table the sheep bleated their satisfaction at returning to their warm folds while the hungry labourers cast a longing look towards the kitchen windows from which streamed forth pleasant promise of a warm and savoury meal the whole of the exterior arrangements of the farm were indicative of the most scrupulous order neatness and exactitude instead of being covered with dirt and dust scattered about and exposed to the inclemency of the season the carts rollers harrows etc with every agricultural implement and some were of the last and best invention were placed well cleaned and painted under a vast shed where the carters were accustomed to arrange their cart harness with the most symmetrical attention to order and method large clean and well laid out the courtyard had none of those huge dung heaps those stagnant pools of filthy water which defaced the finest establishments of la bosse or la brie the poultry-yard surrounded by a green trellising received and shut in all the feathered tribe who after wandering in the fields all day returned home by a small door left open till all were collected when it was carefully closed and secured 
without dwelling too minutely upon every detail we shall merely observe that in all respects this farm passed most justly in the environs for a model farm as much for the excellency of the method by which it was conducted and the abundant crops it produced as for the respectability and correct mode of life which distinguished the various labourers employed there who were soon ranked among the most creditable and efficient workmen of the place the cause of all this prosperity shall be spoken of hereafter meanwhile we will conduct the reader to the trellis gate of the poultry-yard which for the rustic elegance of its perches and poultry-houses was no ways inferior to the farm itself while through the centre flowed a small stream of clear limpid water the bed of which was laid down with smooth pebbles carefully cleansed from any obstructing substance a sudden stir arose among the winged inhabitants of this charming spot the fowls flew fluttering and cackling from their perches the turkeys gabbled the guinea fowls screamed and the pigeons forsaking their elevated position on the summit of the dove-house descended to the sandy surface of the yard and stood cooing and caressing each other with every manifestation of joy the arrival of fleur de marie had occasioned all these ecstatic delights a more charming model than the goualeuse could not have been desired by greuze or watteau had her cheeks possessed a little more rondeur or been visited by a brighter tinge but in spite of their delicate paleness the expression of her features the tout ensemble of her figure and the gracefulness of her attitude would have rendered her worthy of exercising the crayons of even the celebrated artists we have alluded to the small round cap of fleur de marie displayed her fair forehead and light braided hair in common with all the young girls in the environs of paris above this cap but still exposing the crown and ears she wore a large red cotton handkerchief folded smoothly and pinned behind her head while the long ends waving gracefully over her shoulders formed a costume which for graceful effect might be envied by the tasteful coiffeur of italy or switzerland a handkerchief of snow-white linen crossed over her bosom was half concealed by the high and spreading front of her coarse cloth apron a jacket of blue woollen cloth with tight sleeves displayed her slender figure and descended half-way down her thick skirt of dark striped fustian white cotton stockings and tied shoes partly covered by sabots furnished with a leather strap for the instep completed this costume of rustic simplicity to which the natural grace of fleur de marie lent an inexpressible charm holding in one hand the two corners of her apron with the other she distributed handfuls of grain among the winged crowd by which she was surrounded one beautiful pigeon of a silvery whiteness with beak and feet of a rich purple colour more presuming or more indulged than the rest after having flown several times around fleur de marie at length alighted on her shoulder the young girl as though well used to these familiarities continued wholly undisturbed to throw out continued supplies of grain but half turning her head till its perfect outline alone was visible she gently raised her head and smilingly offered her small rosy lips to meet those of her fond caressing friend the last rays of the setting sun shed a pale golden light over the innocent picture while the goualeuse was thus occupied with her rural cares madame georges and the abbe laporte curé of bouqueval sitting by the fireside in the neat little parlour of the farm were conversing on the one constant theme fleur de marie the old curé with a pensive thoughtful air his head bent downwards and his elbows leaning on his knees mechanically stretched his two trembling hands before the fire madame georges laying aside the needlework on which she had been occupied kept an anxious eye on the abbe as though eagerly waiting for some observation from him after a moment's silence yes said he you are right madame georges it will be better for m rodolph to question marie for she is so filled with deep gratitude and devotion to him that she will probably reveal to him what she persists in concealing from us then since you agree with me monsieur le curé i will write this very evening to the address he left with me the allée des veuves poor child sighed the kind old man she ought to have been so happy here what secret grief can thus be preying on her mind her unhappiness is too deeply fixed to be removed even by her earnest and passionate application to study and yet she has made a most rapid and extraordinary progress since she has been under our care has she not 
she has indeed already she can read and write with the utmost fluency and is already sufficiently advanced in arithmetic to assist me in keeping my farm accounts and then the dear child is so active and industrious and really affords me so much assistance as both surprises me and moves me to tears you know that spite of my repeated remonstrances she persisted in working so hard that i became quite alarmed lest such toil should seriously affect her health i am thankful to hear from you resumed the worthy cure that your negro doctor has fully quieted your apprehensions respecting the cough your young friend suffered from he says it is merely temporary and gives no reason for uneasiness oh that kind excellent monsieur david he really appeared to feel the same interest in the poor girl that we did who know her sad story she is universally beloved and respected by all on the farm though that is not surprising as thanks to the generous and elevated views of m rodolph all the persons employed on it are selected for their good sense and excellent conduct from all parts of the kingdom but were it not so were they of the common herd of vulgar-minded labourers they could not help feeling the influence of marie's angelic sweetness and timid graceful manner as though she were always deprecating anger or beseeching pardon for some involuntary fault unfortunate being as though she alone were to blame after remaining for several minutes buried in reflection the abbe resumed did you not tell me that this deep dejection of marie's might be dated from the time when madame dubreuil who rents under the duke of lucenay paid her a visit during the feast of the holy ghost yes monsieur le cure i did and yet madame dubreuil and her daughter clara a perfect model of candour and goodness were as much taken with our dear child as every one else who approaches her and both of them lavished on her every mark of the most affectionate regard you know that we pass the sunday alternately at each other's houses but it invariably happens that when we return from our sunday excursion to arnouville where madame dubreuil and her daughter reside the melancholy of my dear marie seems augmented and her spirits more depressed than ever i cannot comprehend why this should be when madame dubreuil treats her like a second daughter and the sweet clara loves her with the tender affection of a sister in truth madame georges it is a fearful mystery what can occasion all this hidden sorrow when here she need not have a single care the difference between her present and past life must be as great as that which exists between heaven and the abode of the damned surely hers is not an ungrateful disposition she ungrateful oh no monsieur le cure her sensitive and affectionate nature magnifies the slightest service rendered her and she appears as though her gratitude could never be sufficiently evinced there is too in her every thought an instinctive delicacy and fineness of feeling wholly incompatible with ingratitude which could never be harboured in so noble a nature as that of my charge dear marie how anxious does she seem to earn the bread she eats and how eagerly she strives to compensate the hospitality shown her by every exertion she can make or service she can render and then except on sunday when i make it a point she should dress herself with more regard to appearance to accompany me to church she will only wear the coarse humble garments worn by our young peasant girls and yet there is in her such an air of native superiority so natural a grace that one would not desire to see her otherwise attired would they monsieur le cure ah mother's pride beware said the old priest smiling at these words tears filled the eyes of madame georges she thought of her long-lost child and of his possible destiny come come dear friend cheer up look upon our dear marie as sent by a gracious providence to occupy your maternal affections until the blessed moment when he shall restore you your son and besides you have a sacred duty to perform towards this child of your adoption are you not her baptismal godmother and believe me when that office is worthily discharged it almost equals that of a mother as for m rodolph he has discharged his obligation of godfather by anticipation for in snatching her from the abyss of crime into which her misfortunes and her helplessness had cast her he may be said to have caused her immortal existence to begin doubtless the poor thing has never received the sacrament of our holy church 
do you think monsieur le cure she is now sufficiently acquainted with its sanctified purposes to be admitted to a participation of it i will take an opportunity of learning her sentiments on the subject as we walk back to the rectory i shall then apprise her that the holy ceremony will take place probably in about a fortnight from hence how gratefully she will receive such an information her religious feelings are the strongest i have ever met with alas poor thing she has deep and heavy expiation to make for the errors of her past life nay monsieur l'abbé consider abandoned so young without resource without friends almost without a knowledge of good or evil plunged involuntarily into the very vortex of crime what was there to prevent her from falling the bitter sacrifice she has been the clear moral sense of right and wrong implanted by the creator in every breast should have withheld her and besides we have no evidence of her having even sought to escape from the horrible fate into which she had fallen is there no friendly hand to be found in paris to listen to the cries of suffering virtue is charity so rare so hard to obtain in that large city let us hope not monsieur l'abbé but how to discover it is the difficulty ere arriving at the knowledge of one kind commiserating christian think of the refusals the rebukes the denials to be endured and then in such a case as our poor marie's it was no passing temporary aid that could avail her but the steady continued patronage and support the being placed in the way to earn an honest livelihood many tender and pitying mothers would have succoured her had they known her sad case i doubt not but it was first requisite to secure the happiness of knowing where to meet with them trust me i too have known want and misery but for one of those providential chances which alas too late threw poor marie in the way of m rodolph but for one of those casualties the wretched and destitute most commonly repulsed with rude denial on their first applications believe pity irretrievably lost and pressed by hunger fierce clamorous hunger often seek advice that relief they despair to obtain from commiseration at this moment the goualeuse entered the parlour where have you been my dear child inquired madame georges anxiously visiting the fruit-house madame after having shut up the hen-houses and gates of the poultry-yard all the fruit has kept excellently all but those i ran away with at eight now marie why take all this fatigue upon yourself you should have left all this tiring work to claudine i fear you have quite tired yourself no no dear madame georges i wouldn't let claudine help me for the world i take so much delight in my fruit-house the smell of the beautiful ripe fruit is so delicious monsieur le cure said madame georges you must go some day and see marie's fruit-house you can scarcely imagine the taste with which she has arranged it each different variety of fruit is separated by rows of grapes and the grapes are again divided off by strips of moss oh yes monsieur le cure pray do come and see it said the goualeuse innocently i am sure you would be pleased with it you would be surprised what a pretty contrast the moss makes to the bright rosy apples or the rich golden pears there are some such lovely waxen apples quite a pure red and white and really as they lie surrounded by the soft green moss i cannot help thinking of the heads of little cherubim just peeping out from the glorious clouds of heaven added the delighted goualeuse speaking with all the enthusiasm of an artist of the work of her creation the cure looked at madame georges then smilingly replied to fleur de marie i have already admired the dairy over which you preside my child and can venture to declare it perfect in its way the most particular dairy woman might envy you the perfection to which you have brought it ere long i promise myself the pleasure of visiting your fruit-house and passing a similar compliment on your skill in arrangement you shall then introduce me to those charming rosy apples and delicious golden pears as well as to the little cherubim pippins so prettily peeping from their mossy beds but see the sun has already set you will scarcely have sufficient time to conduct me back to the rectory house and return before dark come my child fetch your cloak and let us be gone or now i think of it do you remain at home this cold bitter night and let one of the farm servants go home with me oh monsieur le cure replied the kind madame georges 
marie will be quite wretched if she is not allowed to accompany you she so much enjoys the happiness of escorting you home every evening indeed monsieur le cure added the goualeuse timidly raising her large blue eyes to the priest's countenance i shall fear you are displeased with me if you do not permit me to accompany you as usual well then my dear child wrap yourself up very warm and let us go fleur de marie hastily threw over her shoulders a sort of cloak of coarse white cloth edged with black velvet and with a large hood to be drawn at pleasure over the head thus equipped she eagerly offered her arm to her venerable friend happily said he in taking it the distance is but trifling and the road both good and safe to pass at all hours as it is somewhat later to-night than usual said madame georges will you have one of the farm people to return with you marie do you take me for a coward said marie playfully i am very much obliged to you for your good opinion madame no pray do not let any one be called away on my account it is not a quarter of an hour's walk from here to the rectory i shall be back long before dark well as you like i merely thought it would be company for you for as to fearing thank heaven there is no cause loose vagabond people likely to interrupt your progress are wholly unknown here and were i not equally sure of the absence of all danger i would not accept this dear child's arm added the cure useful as i confess i find it and leaning on fleur de marie who regulated her light step to suit the slow and laboured pace of the old man the two friends quitted the farm a few minutes walk brought the goualeuse and the priest close to the hollow road in which the schoolmaster the chouette and tortillard were lying in ambush End of chapter three read by celine major